The Lawyers, Guns, and Money Game of Thrones broadcast. Uh, I'm Scott Eric Kaufman, S.A.K. This is Stephen Atwell. Uh, we are going to be talking about the third episode of this season, Walk of Punishment, which, uh, well, we'll talk about how that gets worked into the show uh, mm -hmm. later on. And uh, also, we do apologize. It is daylight, uh, as you can tell, if you're watching this. Um, and then and, and we, we look weird -er than normal, <laughs> or at least I do. Mm. None of that nice soda burking blue effect. But um, all right, so uh, I, I'll let uh, see if we get started. And uh, Okay. Sure. Um, so we, we open with this set piece in the Riverlands with uh, Edmure Tully trying and failing to uh, set his father's sort of Viking, you know, funeral boat on fire and then transitioning into uh, the scene where, um, you know, Catelyn's dealing with the, the death of her father, and then Rob Stark kind of upbraiding Edmure for his, his failures on the battlefield. And what I thought was strange was, I liked how these scenes were directed, I liked how they were acted, I liked the, the script, which normally means I'd like it, but... I think the 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 show has not really made comprehensible what Rob is doing militarily speaking, um, and I, I meant you know this I mentioned this because it came up in the uh, the Spencer Ackerman article and and my response to it that you know Rob Stark spends most of season two tracking the book in terms of what he's doing. And before you go on, we should note, we will have that article and any responses to it up at lawyersgunsandmoneyblog.com uh, very shortly. So. Yeah. And then he suddenly teleports to Heron Hall and then teleports back to River Run, which is a, a sort of a strange divergence from the book. And the telescoping of what normally happened in the book in regards to... Uh, this battle that Edmure won that he should have lost um, doesn't really make sense. I mean, I just realized after writing that article that they describe uh, the mountain as being driven back to Casterly Rock, which is geographically impossible. <laughs> it starts the battle, you know, coming out of Heron Hall, which is to the east of River Run, and Casterly Rock is to the west of River Run, and there's a river in between, and Edmure has stopped him crossing that river. So geographically, this battle can't have happened. Um, and I guess what I find irritating is that I think this could have been made very, very clear with just a few dialogue changes and a few sort of cheap, you know, a messenger enters a tent and says, you know, Lord Tywin is marching towards you know, is marching towards River Run, and Rob Stark says, you know, all is planned. Or, you know, tell tell my uncle to hold the castle. Um, or, you know, something like that, just to set things up so that this doesn't appear out of nowhere and we're left with no context about what this battle means. Because in the books, it is the single, ar I mean, arguably, the single most strategically important kind of missed turning point in the whole War of Five Kings. So that's what angered me. Well, and I mean, part of me, just to play devil's advocate, would, would say maybe that's uh, done on purpose. The, the, the whole point and, and uh, kind of orchestration of the war on the show has, has been really um, difficult to follow. Mm. Um, and I almost wonder if, if that isn't the point, that we're getting sort of oh, a perspective the on the war that is not the high and mighty general's perspective, but the perspective of the average soldier who just happens to walk in on conversations between important people. Um, 
but doesn't understand the entire um, scope of of what's going on. I mean, that that's sort of a cheap excuse, though. I mean, I don't want to press that too hard. Um, <laughs> and the only the only evidence I, I I sort of have for that is the fact that some of the characters themselves do seem confused as to yeah. There's a lot of missing information and people acting on kind of mistaken assumptions, which I like. That's that's a good kind of um, uh, good kind that's of a terrible way to read read what is becoming sort of problematic. I mean, when you read the novels, you just sit there with the map. At least I did sit there with a the map open on my my computer screen, so I can yeah. try to figure out okay, where the fuck is Arya in this chapter? You know, yeah, I just and completely lost her. And there's a there's a kind of a subtext that gets lost because, uh, you know, a lot of this book and the season, I mean, and this isn't a spoiler; it's more a thematic thing, is about missed opportunities and missed connections. That, you know, Arya at various times is so close to the rest of her family, but just takes, you know. A wrong path of you know exactly the wrong moment where if she'd stayed on it, you know all of a sudden there's you know there's a different meeting or you know if if two other you know if if another character just intersected at a slightly different time you know if Rob Stark for example had been there at um, Heron Hall when when Jamie's captured things go very differently. You, you um, know, and what, what's strange and and this I, I know we we didn't plan on on mentioning this but the the conversation between Melisandre and, and Stannis, and, and, and I'm thinking yes. about missed opportunities and, and, and what the show is doing with those. When she says she's going after more of Robert's blood, but that she's going to... She says she's going to um, River Run to find it? She's going to... The Riverlands. Riverlands to find it? She's, she's not going after... Um, she must be going after... Gendry. Gendry. Yeah. They've, uh, what they've done is they've collapsed a character yeah. who appears only in the books with, um, with Gendry. And this is, I think it's going to be one of those things that, like the Arya being Tywin's cupbearer in season two, is actually going to be a really interesting I think so. change uh, yeah. from the books. It puts, her on a, it puts Arya on a collision with another character from the novels as opposed to her just yeah. kind of disconnecting from the story completely. Well, and and also, I mean, it changes Gendry's plot line dramatically. Well, he, he's still there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, he's still there, but it's also the case that, you know, in the books, he kind of, he's a tertiary character after, you know, after this book, he's a tertiary character. He shows up now and again, but not doing anything interesting, particularly. And this is an opportunity to do something very different with him. Likewise, yeah. I think it's going to be very, very interesting to have the two main characters we've met who are both representatives of R'hllor, the, the Lord of Light, but have incredibly different ways of representing and interpreting their faith, yeah. interact. You know, Melisandre is a true believer, whatever else you'd say about her, and she's about to meet Beric Dondarrion, and what that's going to do to her faith, I find really curious. Yeah, so there, for for every missed opportunity that 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 we're focusing on in in terms of you know both in the novel and as it's being transitioned to screen, they do seem to be creating some interesting. Um, sure, and possible. it's a sign that it can be done right. Yeah, you know, it's it's not that the task is beyond the writers; it's that they're making. It's that you know they they have a batting average, I guess you'd call it, since we're in baseball time now. <laughs> um, so. What did you think of the use of uh, transitioning back to, to the Rob Stark and the Tullys and then the next scene with, with uh, Tywin and the small council? What did you think of the use of silences? Because I thought it was interesting. You know, here we have an episode written by the main showrunners and directed by the main showrunners, people who for their, in their directorial debut, who have been wordsmiths you know, their professional lives, using silence so much. Well, the the first big example of this actually is is before that. It's it's when they're trying to um, set the funeral pyre alight, mm -hmm. and I didn't like that first one when um, when Blackfish Blackfish uh, mm -hmm. when he walks 
up to the end of the pier, and he pulls his, his arrow back, and, and then he has this... Well, let's see if I can do this. Then we see this, which um, you can tell he's in the foreground. He's let the arrow go, and mm -hmm. he's not going to watch it fall. Well, that's kind of a rule of cool thing. It's you know exactly. It's it's the walking away. It's the the sort of you know Jordan esque. I know I hit this shot. I don't even have to watch it go in. Well, I thought, I thought that was very poorly done, actually. I, um, I, I liked it, and I thought the more significant shot actually comes a little bit before when he's looking at the flag. Well, yeah, he, he checks the flag to test the wind, but it's also, uh, you know, he's reproaching Tully for what he failed to do when he was aiming, which is, yeah. you know, look at the fucking flag, and, see where the wind's going. And it's, it, I think it, it, it kind of redeems the moment where he doesn't turn around, he doesn't watch the arrow go in that it, it shows very quietly the blackfish as someone as a professional, as someone who will get the job done in contrast so, to Ed Muir, who, you know, I think the best description of, of him that I've ever heard um, comes from this great um, uh, Game of Thrones blog called uh, Stannis is the Fury that describes him as the Tully who couldn't. Well... Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess it's just I don't. There's nothing like quiet or humble about about taking you know taking the the, the the jump shot and walking away before because you just know it's all net. That's yeah. not a that's not really a humble move for me. That that that's, that's, that's right. humble was the wrong word. More um, restrained. Professional. I think I think yeah. that was that he knows the job he's doing. Uh, but the next scene, I mean, obviously the the musical chair scene. Yeah. In the new office of the of the hand of the king, that a lot um, of redecorating so I, going on in King's Landing. Yeah, there, there there is, and I mean it's 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 a reflection of 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 the power plays because the ability to move a meeting, to to move one all around, and and you know reschedule things. I don't like I don't know some assholes done with this podcast. Um, <laughs> uh, but the ability, the ability to there is some sort of power to to, to dictate oh, when absolutely. and where you're going to move. And that's that's what the whole, the whole point of the scene is, is we are all going to have a conversation without saying anything until, you know, Tyrion actually openly acknowledges that, you know, I see what you did there, Dad. Um, yeah. But, no, it's a, it's a brilliantly um, shot little bit of, you know, silent film comedy. Uh, yeah. You know, you can almost see Harpo and Groucho and, Chico kind of doing this same little routine. Running around the table with chairs, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, also, the, the big word is also so Tyrion... indicative of who they are, you know. Cat yeah. needs to, one, not sit where she was told to sit. Because the searching? other thing is, her dad arranged the chairs. Yes. Right? And um, he also chose where to sit. You'll notice that in season one, both Eddard and Robert sit in the middle of the table. With yes. their advisors to either side of them, in a, you know, but first that, of all, that's yeah. that's the traditional depiction of a king and council. But it's also, you know, alluding to the the Last Supper kind of thing. Yeah. Um, whereas Tywin very deliberately puts himself at one pole of power, and then makes everyone else that. decide where they stand in relation to him. Yeah. Well, I don't think. I, I mean, maybe yeah. He he wants them to decide where they stand in relation. But on the other hand, he he's. I, I I think he wanted that the other end of the table empty because he's not actually saying, "Look, I'm I'm the host." Um, uh, hold on one second. I appear to be invaded. And now for a schedule break. Like all academics, I yes have a cat. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think I I think. Tywin had the chairs the way he wanted them arranged. He wanted to see that sort of empty vacuum of power, and you don't actually know which side the host is sitting on in this in, in this arrangement, mm. um, other than that old like Western convention that, that the most important person is the, in the room is the one who puts their back to the wall so that they can <laughs> survey everything and can't and be so shot. no one can sneak up behind and shoot them. But um, so that it's sort of implicit that he's at the head of the table. Um, yeah. But obviously, once they start playing musical chairs, uh, the council 
members who are who are not blood relatives, they all sit exactly where they're supposed to because that's indicative of, of how they have gotten the power that they have. That's well, that's I, how they. I, I I read it a little bit differently, which is Varys tries to make a move for the first chair, but Littlefinger swoops past him. Yeah. Which is kind of symbolic of what's happened exactly. in their in their power relationship, and then Pycelle is kind of, you know, a little bit behind, slower than everyone else, so he just sits down in the first available chair. And then the really interesting thing is what Cersei does with all of this. Well, yeah, the, the one thing she she moves to the other side of the table, as if to say, we are we're not different in in. In degree, we are different in kind. Yes, exactly. You are those kind of the table people. I am this kind. You are you are servants. I am family. And she sits right at his right hand. Not symbolic at all. But but then also, I mean, when Tyrion comes in, uh, there are a number of what well, reaction shots. Oh, Tyrion yeah. walks in, and uh, if you if you. It, it's sort of amusing as as he's watching Cersei move the chair, and let's see if I can do this again. Um, he's watching her move the chair, and you can see him let her here. Mm -hmm. He's watching her, and she knows she's putting on a show. Yeah. And he's in the foreground, she's in the background. The only people who are really in focus are are, are the counselors. The light is sort of drawing our eye there too. Um, but what's really sort of interesting about what follows is it's, it's really about Tyrion sitting there and figuring out what's going on before anybody else does. Yeah. Because even, even Tywin is, is surprised when his daughter moves the chair. He shoots her this sort of funny look, and I'll, I'll yeah. have this all up in a, in a formal post, but he shoots her this funny look, and then he looks at Tyrion, but Tyrion does not return his look. Instead, he starts looking around the table. And there are these, the, as you're talking about the silences, the, the, those are, they're not silences, they're comedic beats. Yeah. I mean, they're really, it's like, you know, one, two, three, wait for it, four, five. Now I'm going to grab the chair. And he doesn't just grab the chair, like. He scrapes he, it. Yeah, and he, and he pulls it. You know what that reminded me of? Hmm. Men in Black, which is a really weird reference. But there's a scene where, um, uh, Will Smith's character is taking the test and he's pulling that, that table over to him and it's just making this, you know, oh, yeah, horrendous right shriek. Yeah, he's making yeah. this horrendous shriek and everyone else is kind of reacting to it. And you almost get the sense that Tyrion is like deliberately drawing out how awkward this is. Oh yeah, he is. And, and even you though know, he and, grabs the chair, he doesn't just, he, he, like, he hugs it and then he tips it and then he pulls it. Yeah. Um, it's really, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's very nicely done. Because then he just, and again, with the comedic timing, then he sits down. And then they cut to Tywin. And then they cut to Tyrion. Then they cut to Cersei. And then they yeah, cut and to Cersei Tyrion. And Cersei does this, this great kind of sibling eye roll, like, oh my god, I knew you'd do that. You're such a but brat. she didn't. See, that's the thing. Oh, really? She didn't. She expected him. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chair around to her, to, to her side of the table. I mean, okay, so it's more like I can't believe you just did that. I, yeah, I can't believe you just confused people as to who's in charge, and the fact that you know he will be in charge of something by the you know is significant mm -hmm. as well. Um, but yeah, that was a a brilliantly executed little comedic scene. Um, I, I think, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier about the fact that this is, you know, uh, one of the showrunners, it's, 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 which one, it's Weiss. Benioff, Benioff is directing, directing. although it's, it's not clear because there, there are um, union rules about co-directing credits. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure whether it's just him or it's the both of them. I think they both got credit for the writing um, yeah. of the episode. But, I mean, uh, a lot of that is, especially when things are directed, in tandem. I mean, each of the directors does have their individual style. Um, like, I can, at this point, tell the difference um, between a Minahan episode and, 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 and other directors. But uh, I think what this almost was, and as you said, the sort of first-time debut director on their own show, these set pieces, they're a little bit, uh, they're a little bit showy. It's a bit showing yeah. off. Like, 
oh, you think I'm the word guy? Well, I'll show you. I'll, I will do things without words. I will, I will be a visual storyteller. Um, and I think they were largely successful, uh, mm -hmm. especially in light of the fact that, you know, what what they did with <laughs> what they did with Martin's words and the order of things. Yeah. You know, it's almost as if well, let's go with a little bit visual here because we we are really going to be fucking with the narrative. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Maybe no one will notice if we just make a few really funny set pieces. Um, that that we're changing things, quite a few of them. Yeah. Or just so, it, putting stuff that's in later books and earlier books in, in, in into this season. Yeah. Which yeah. I'm fine with. Well, and you know they, I don't envy them the task of turning these books, which are free to kind of pick up and drop characters into coherent narrative arcs for everybody. Um, but I think they're really succeeding interestingly with Theon. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say this, uh, they can direct a good action sequence. The, the chase sequence through the woods on horseback. Um, it's almost shot for shot, though, with this, the scene uh, with Will in the opening episode, right, right from the be being on top of the hill, turning around, recognizing yeah. you're being chased, then cutting, reversing to a shot of people coming over the hill as you're running. To, I mean... Yeah, it, I've also heard that it... I've also heard uh, comparisons to the the uh, the land speeder chases in uh, Return of the Jedi. Uh, in terms I of... I think anytime, any, anytime anyone does that sort of panning through large trees at this point, you're going to get the... Yeah, comparison to to Return of the Jedi. I mean, it's just it's it's a chase scene. Initially, the degree of difficulty was quite high when um, Lucas didn't direct Return of the Jedi. It wasn't I don't remember. Yeah, it, but there was an initially a, a degree of difficulty. It's really b weird you bring up Return of the Jedi though, because. Um, and I wasn't going to bring this up because I was afraid of this podcast getting nerdier than it already is. Uh, but uh, I really saw that the look on Danny's face when she's arguing with the slave masters, right? And we have the the translation going on mm -hmm. between her standing sort of alone, surrounded by the slaver. Oh. Oh, 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 right, it's, right, it's right. Right over the pit. It's like, yeah, it's like, I love that. Oh, that's smile awesome. on her face. Like, oh, yeah, are you really? Java, I'm going to give you one last chance. Yeah. I'll give, this negotiation doesn't have to one end dragon. the way it's going to end. Um, but it, the, I really, I saw that when I was watching, and it's like, all right, Scott, do not bring this up in the podcast because people already think eh, you're. But I, I, I definitely see the comparison to Return of the Jedi there. The, running through the trees, I mean, you see that. Yeah. I mean, you, you sort of see that everywhere. But structurally, and, and in terms yeah. of the composition, the Return of the Jedi is definitely there in the slaver yeah. scene. On, um, on the other hand, you know, I don't think any of the Star Wars movies quite had the, the move towards rape as a, as a tool of war. Uh, and, you know, the, the, when Theon finally gets caught, it's brutal. I mean, when he takes that... that it was just, everyone, yeah, no. a little round uh, of applause for you, that segue. That much. was... Um, very well done. <laughs> yeah. When when Theon takes that mace to the chest and lands wheezing like a fish on the ground, it oh my god, that looks like it hurts. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, there is this, you know, sudden brutal kind of intimation of rape, um, which, you know, is doubly ironic for Theon because in season one and two, he's always been a character who, who tries to reinforce his masculinity through yeah, coarse sex, sex in some way or, or another. And then we get this very interesting moment where the nameless helper all of a sudden kind of out of nowhere, you know, literally you can't see him as he's just, you know, shooting down soldiers left and right. Um, and then moves in for that kind of close-up kill, and there's that very significant line where he said, where that soldier says, you little bastard. Um, 
and then we get this kind of moment of you know here's a here's a heroic introduction for this character right as he kind of swaggers in with his bow and his arrows and helps Theon up and yes he doesn't just help him up he lends him a hand hand. second second to last scene in the episode and he's lending him a hand yeah Um, very clever we see what you did there Um, yeah but there are a lot of those moments and I think that is uh, in part the overcompensation on the part of the director but um, but yeah, it, it was it was a nicely done. But continue uh, with with rapist intimidation. That, yeah, that, sure. That so, really... you know, then that gets echoed with with Jamie and Brienne, where they're sort of, you know, immediately discussing, you know, on horseback. You know, there's there's this kind of uh, odd couple bickering about, you know, was Jamie, you know, washed up as a swordsman or not? Um, but then it quickly turns to the to the issue of rape um, and. You know, is it better to survive or or die? Um, well, in, kind of a, a in both of cases, moment. both both with Theon and Brienne, rape is not being. I mean, it's being used as and and I know this sounds odd, but it, it's being used to emasculate them, right? Yes. It's it's being used to make them feel like they're less of. And so so the you know Theon used rape to kind of show dominance over over women. Because he felt insecure about his position, you know, right. uh, among the Starks. Th- when they're trying to rape Theon, they are they are trying to, you know, take his own self-image away. Exactly. That's exactly what they are trying to do with Brienne as well, and in a way that connects with what they're going to do to Jamie. I mean, they're oh, going absolutely. to take away the core of his identity. Yeah, um, and it also shows that no one's safe, right? Whether you're rich or poor. Whether you're a man or a woman, you are still in danger of having, you know, your your bodily integrity, your self identity, your agency completely ripped away from you. And Admittedly, anyone anyone watching a season three podcast of Game of Thrones is well aware of the fact that no one's safe. But yeah, um, but this yeah. is, I mean, there, there's a certain personal aspect to this. And the the other thing I thought was interesting, I'll I'll bring this up when we talk more about the Jamie bit. But you'll notice they're they're having this conversation as the Bolton men are singing the Bear and the Maiden Fair, and we'll come back to that later. And I just want to like we highlight to the use really, of that. We have to relive that moment. Well, the the <sighs> thing about that moment is that I think the song is more important than people have realized. Um, in that you know, when Jamie has his hand cut off, and we smash cut to this upbeat drinking song, everyone shouting and cheering, and it's deliberately jarring and disorienting and kind of mood, you know, it's a mood shift in an episode full of mood shifts where they go from, you know, these really grim and brutal scenes to, you know, comedy and back and forth. But if you look at the lyrics of the song, they're about a woman basically being assaulted by a bear, sexually assaulted by a bear. And coming to enjoy the experience. So the song has rape culture written into it. And I think it's kind of a deliberate screwing with the audience, which says, oh, you like this song, don't you? All you fans of the books. And, you know... Fans of the whole that say about Yeah, what does it say about you that you, you like the books? Or, sorry, that you like this song. And by, you know, implication, what does it say that you like this show, Right. We've just given you, you know, are you not entertained? We've just given you an hour of dismemberment and, you know, threatened rape. And here's a song to kind of top it all off. And why are you now feeling, you know, uncomfortable and weirded out? So I thought that was yeah, very... Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, part of, part of my dislike, and, and it's strange because it's one of my favorite television shows. The whole study is one of my favorite bands. But this is the second time the show has sort of made me unhappy with their selection of of, of music at the end of uh, uh, Blackwater, all of a sudden I you know I hear the National, another yeah. one of my favorite bands, um, and if you ever want to hear them, you can go to my blog and maybe do a search for them and any <laughs> zipped files you might find might be of help to you. But um, uh, there's a you know I two bands I love, I think the mood was right. It's just at the same time it didn't work for me at all. Um, <laughs> I, I I thought because in part you said that you know the whole 
you know, the song itself is grim, and it gets away. It sounds like a drinking song. It gets away from the... The problem with that is that the whole study, they write grim drinking songs about the terrible things that happen to you at, at state fairs and, and behind dances. And, you know, it, it, it's just... It is... A, it, it, it's not, like, weird and jarring for me to think, oh, the whole study are singing a song about someone raping a band. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, if you didn't know the band, it's more... Because I was yeah. you know, looking at, you know, um, uh, comment threads on various sites and on Reddit and so forth, and a lot of people were truly shocked. I mean, part of this has to do with the fact that a lot of people are pirating the show, and um, one of the pirated copies somehow transposed the song over the last, like, two... last 30 seconds of dialogue. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, th I think in terms of, like, a shock factor, I think it worked. I think it, like, freaked a lot of people out. I, I, I could see that. It's just, you know, again, I, and I just, I, I was pulling up the, I mean, the whole set of a band that has songs like that are called The Chill Out Tent, about what happens to a bunch of people at a concert when they end up in the chill out tent, and, you know, their mouths were Fizzy wow. with the cherry cola, they had the privacy of bed sheets, and the other kids were in comas. I mean, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's a fun, upbeat mm. song, but it's, it's, it's about you being the only non comatose person dying of heat exhaustion in a chill out tent. I mean, it's a, yeah. which, which seems sort of, of, of a piece with, um, with the general mood of the episode. Um, but the other weird thing is it's the, yeah. it's the second time that that weekend, um, the weekend of 4, 14, 4, 13, 2013, for future reference. Um, 4, 13, we, we get Louis C.K. talking, uh, being in, in his yes. say, high feminist mode, where he's talking about the, the, the different dangers uh, that men and women face when dating. Men face the danger of rejection. Women face the danger of men. Right? And, yeah. and he, he likens all dates that, that women go on. Like, men can, might get turned down for sex. Women, you never know if you get, a, you know, it's like if you're going out there and he actually says dating, uh, going on a date with something that's half, half lion, half bear. And, and you're like, I hope this one doesn't huh. So it was like two nights in a row I'm having to deal with, with bears raping women, um, which I just, I, I found a little disconcerting in, in, in a sort of take me out of the show kind of way. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that has nothing to do, that's a total coincidence, and HBO had nothing, but no, HBO could have put those on at different times. They didn't have <laughs> to do all bear raping all weekend. Um, yeah. Even if they were both being done in interesting ways, it was still weird. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, speaking of weirdness, uh, what about that spiral of horse heads at the Fist of the First Men? Um, well, uh, one, it, 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 it's demonstrating uh, some artistic growth on the part of uh, the White Walkers, because if you remember, you know, the previous body art by by the White yeah. Walkers involved just putting things in a simple circle with a line through it, right? Yeah. Um, in almost, uh, you know, it was a very simple thing. Whereas this was was not a simple a simple thing at all. And let me pull up for those of you who are watching the podcast. Um, no, it's not going to let me pull it up, is it? There hey. we go. Okay. Um, as long as I'm talking, it should be up there. Hey! Okay, so now you can see it. Look at the, the lovely spiral design. The horses all seem to be running toward the center, um, mm. and they seem to be becoming less horse. Like, they start out as legs, and then they become torsos, and then in the center is the heads. And, of course, I don't think it's a coincidence that all the they got these heads in the middle, and what are they doing? They're having a confab. I mean, this is the kind of thing that, right, Sorkin would be very happy with. They're not quite walking and talking, but they're there <laughs> in, in the center, right, with all of this literal movement around them. I mean, it, it, it's almost like a painting of a walk and talk. If you, if it, if you had to paint a walk and talk in, in sort of medieval art, yeah. And and you knew something about perspective, or you know, still didn't, as the case might be, like like, like a, you know, Giotto or something. Yeah, what it would, it would look something like that. You would have the horses moving, 
with their individual parts. I mean, it's very like Bayou Tapestry kind of. Um, yeah. And then the, the people having the conversation right there in the middle of the circle. Um, and the conversation isn't about what they know. It's about what they don't. Right, because they're yeah. like, didn't didn't you see a whole bunch of crows here? I saw the crows; they were there. I mean, they were they're they're right now there. They're somewhere else. Um, but yeah, it's a it's it's a striking visual image that I I think I probably made a little more out of just then than maybe they even intended. Um, because I think it's just supposed to be a sort of frightening thing. Um, well, I mean, it's a frightening thing that that tells you that there. That there is a certain element of personality to the White Walkers that we don't normally associate with zombies. You know, Mance talks to them. Uh, sorry, Mance talks about them. You know, with some familiarity that these are, you know, one might even say a people he's used to dealing with that have a style and an, an intentionality. And um, they do. And they do have a style, and they're definitely trying to intimidate. I mean, this is. I mean, granted, it, it's sort of cliche to say, you know, horse heads are, are intended in <laughs> cinema to intimidate, but, and, and I'm sure that, you know, Jon Snow has not actually seen The Godfather, but um, it really is, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's art for the sake of, of, of intimidation, uh, and it's a, it's obviously effective, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it works, then, but the difference between this and the previous iteration of it that we've had on the show, which was, you know, in the first episode, um, is that in the first episode, uh, the walkers actually do try to kill everyone. Well, which they leave that, one of them to well, carry the story. We don't, but we don't know. I mean, we see Will start to run, but that's, and then we well, just... No, no, we, we see him on his knees, the head rolling towards him in his lap. And then he looks up at them, and they're laughing. You know, realistically, he should have died then. So okay, so then uh, the exact opposite. Of what I was gonna say uh, yeah. these these things because I was gonna say initially they seem to be art for art's sake, but now they're clearly meant as a, m a means of intimidation and communication um, in a very very weird language. In a, but in a language that I think the message is getting across. Yeah. Like, look, look what we can do to your horses. Um, yeah. All of them. I mean, which has grave implications in a, in a, in a winter wonderland. I mean, it's... Yeah, and, you know, and you can see that immediately with the Night's Watch returning to Craster's Keep. Uh, in, a, in a scene that kind of reminded me of, like, Napoleon's army retreating from Moscow, this line of, of you know, weary, pissed-off, starving, freezing men... Um, coming to this place of really uncertain refuge. And, you know, the thing that I thought was interesting is that Mance immediately confronts them about something that previously he's kept very, very secret. He says, I worship the true gods. You know, the, the, when the white comes, it's not going to hurt me. And he's saying this to a gang of men who outnumber him, you know, even though they've lost 200 out of 300 men. There's still a hundred to one, and he, you know, he's throwing in their face the thing that they just lost two hundred men fighting. So, um, Craster, not the best political mind in Westeros. But he also knows that. I mean, he's he's outnumbered, but he also knows who he's dealing with, and he doesn't. You know, I don't think he thinks, you know, Mormons is going to actually take all of his food and let his wife, children starve, right? Yeah. Um, it's, Before it's that, the, I think... He, it's the price know, he paid for, he for dealing deal honorably. About, yeah, but, you know, he makes a big deal about, you know, well, I'll allow you to come in. And the reality is he couldn't stop them. Like, if they just want to, to, to go in, tie him to a, a post and then leave later. There's nothing he could do to stop them. Except he knows that, that that's not going to happen. I mean, again, yeah. he's using, he's, he's using he's the reputation. He's cutting it pretty of, fine. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it's why it, it helps every once in a while to be a little tricksy, you know, to, to, you know, just murder a couple people inside so people know you're capable of it. Um, no, right. I'm not condoning that at all. That's a terrible thing to say. Um, 
it's very Lannister. Uh, I, I, okay, I'm, I'm going to shut up now. Um, uh, the other thing uh, we should talk about in that scene is, is uh, as, as you put it when we were chatting earlier, uh, sort of Sam's complicity in, in Gilly's uh, birth. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's the first of two scenes where we're going to have one character on screen listening to a, a female character off screen um, screaming, uh, right? This is going to be the first, uh, and then we're going to have Jamie uh, listening to Brienne scream uh, in the following scene. But, but right here, this is Sam is is following birth, you know, the 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 outcries from the pangs of birth, and he's he's following it. And at the very end of that scene, and I won't pull this one up because it's too dark. But uh, we have this neat. And a very typical um, cut, and I might be able to pull up uh, later, because it, it happens once again. And it's just a racking focus from one character to another. Um, Gilly's in the foreground, in focus. Background is out of focus. She's screaming. She looks yeah. to her right. So she looks towards the background. And the camera, the focus racks, and then we get Sam's face in focus, and her face is out of focus. And... What that does in film terms is it's a way of, without making an eyeline match, indicating that one character right. has looked at another, and that our focus has, and our attention has shifted in line with what the character was doing. We're going to have the same thing with the slavers, um, with Barristan and uh, uh, Jorah, sure. uh, right? As, as soon as Danny says, oh, you know, all right, fine, I'll give you a dragon. Um, we start on Barristan in the back, and then the camera, the focus racks, and we get into the foreground um, with Jorah, and they're, they know that they're now in on something. But in, and in both cases, like with Sam and Gilly and with, with, with Barristan and, and, and Jorah, we have uh, people who are now engaged in a conspiracy they don't right. know the contours of. They know they're in it together, but yeah. they don't know what it is. And they're not entirely sure how they feel about it yet. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just a neat little use of the rack and focus to, you know, imply conspiracy and then <laughs> leave you up in the air as to what, you know, how... What the result's going to be, yeah. Yeah. Um, Will Sam and Gilly run, you know, what, what are they going to do when they give this slave master a dragon? That can't be a good idea. Um, yeah. Um... So uh, you know, let's let's kind of go into those um, those two scenes. Um, the the bit with Jamie and uh, where he's talking to Locke and he's hearing Brienne struggle and you know, give her credit. You know, throughout the the the, the shouting, it's pretty clear she's fighting. You know, she is not yet under assault. She's, you know, and a lot of the cries there are actually the men that she's, she's battering. Um, and, but, you know, Jamie is clearly, for the first time in his life, actually having, you know, uh, concern for someone that he's not related to and sleeping with. Um, and I really thought that the scene with Locke was really kind of interesting in that it's, you know, paralleling what, what happens with the the walk of punishment that that um, that Danny and her two who her two advisors go on that um, there's this issue of fighting nobly means death um, that you know Jamie is trying to once he kind of sells this lie that Brienne is worth her weight in sapphires then he tries to sell one more argument that you know the war is essentially over for the North, and the smart play for Locke is to switch sides. And Locke reacts very interestingly. I mean, given that he is a rather cruel and venal man, um, that, you know, his reaction is resentment, uh, not avarice. And he kind of, you know, creates this false display of, of uh, deference and courtesy. You know, 
let me give you a chicken. Let me take these chains off. You know, come over here. Isn't this nice? And then, boom, you know, we get this. And I, I was really impressed by how quickly they didn't draw it out. You know, unlike other kind of horrible things happening, I'm thinking of, of uh, Roderick uh, Cassell's head being chopped off. You know, they they made it really sharp, and they kind of did that fake out with the the eye. I I I think that the, part of the reason I think he would have enjoyed kind of letting it go, letting the ruse go on a little further. But I, I think he realizes that Jamie would have caught on. Um, yeah. And he knew he had a he had a small window of opportunity after Brand got was brought back, in which he could continue negotiating under false pretense in the way he was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was quite abrupt. It was just, yeah. here you go. Greatest swordsman and, in the land, not anymore. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, just switching to the, the Astapor scene, I mean, I just did want to, to pull out, We in this episode, we have three walks of punishment. We have the Night's Watch on their trek back to the wall. We have Jamie and Brienne um, being, you know, trekking through the forest. Oh, actually, no, we've got four. Um, we have Theon's escape on horseback. And then we have this, um, this walkway by the, you know, this sort of boardwalk where slaves are put on crucifixes. And you notice, I mean, I just wanted to pull this out for people who may not have caught this. The purpose of the walk of, of punishment is that masters bring their slaves along this walkway so that they can see what the cost of... You know, and this is where we sort of see the machinery of slavery at work, even as it's being debated, that you know they have engineered things such that, you know, People live in in fear of random death and excruciating pain for any infraction, um, and that you know by by crucifying a few you cow the many. At the same time that that Jorah is spinning slavery as I guess the Westerosi equivalent of like precision bombing, that the yeah. unsullied will not rape, they will not pillage unless you tell them to. Well, they can't rape in it in any case. You forgot one walk. And and oh, I brought one? up Sorkin earlier, but it's the walk uh, that Danny and Misandre take after yes. he's done the trade, and that is a sort of classic And Sorkin. they're talking about the, that's the a dangers power of war. Yes. That's a power I walk. I agree. That's, that's the president and his advisors walking down the hall yeah. and delivering what are sort of corny lines that the writers think uh, aren't quite as corny as the, the rest of us do. Uh, we are not. We are not men. Yeah. She but, says. you know, I did I did think it was that, that whole sequence was actually, on the whole, pretty good that you have Jorah arguing, you know, arguing for slavery, but this time, you know, not appealing to Danny's kind of desire to help the slaves, but more her desire to be a kind of gentle conqueror, you have Barristan arguing the kind of the political side of war that, you know, you have to, if you're going to keep the country that you want to take, you know, inspire people, you know, and that an army of slaves is going to be very uninspiring. Um, given that one of the few moral things that Westeros has going for it is that it, it has banned slavery and that Daenerys is looking for a third option. And really, um, you know, when she's in negotiations with the slavers, that she's setting the term. She's saying, I'm not going to take 120. I'm not going to sell you my Dothraki. Um, I will take all the soldiers you have. I will take this interpreter as well. Um, and, you know, making a really good power move against her advisors when they, they kind of they pull a Frodo. Um, no, Fredo, not Frodo. Sorry. <laughs> Big difference. Got my references wrong there. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be very fun to, to watch that play out. And the other the other interesting thing about those negotiations, uh, and I'll I'll just bring it up real quick, is that Danny literally does not move. Yeah, she yeah. she doesn't. And 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 when 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 we talk about negotiations, we're like, well, they were very stubborn. They wouldn't budge an inch. 
She yeah. literally does not, not budge an inch. An inch. Yeah. And the camera just keeps on getting closer and closer to her. Mm. And it's 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 really it's really interesting. So we go from that shot to this shot to Yeah, okay, I lost it. To this. Uh, and for those of you listening, those are three edit in, in reverses away from Danny to the slavers back to Danny. And every time they reverse, the background gets fuzzier and the scale of the shot shuffling. gets closer. Until mm. we end up with this close-up of her. And it's a really... Like, this is someone who is not feeling powerful, but she's not moving. She is not leaving until she gets what she wants. Yeah. And yeah. there, you know, the the scene that we were just talking about, or the, the racking focus that we were just talking about between her advisors is, is, is absolutely belied by the look on her face right there and, and her absolute intractability, physical. Yeah, and total mental. confidence. She knows exactly what she's doing, and, and we won't say what that is, um, but I really wish we could because I really wanted that to happen in the episode because I love those big kind of moments, but um, something. She obviously has something up her sleeve, and yeah. um, that's all we'll say about that. Um, yeah. Um, finally, one last complaint uh, before we, I don't know, wrap up. Um, and is what the hell was going on with the Podrick scene? Uh, why in a discussion of Westerosi finance do we suddenly like slip into some 80s like teen sex comedy? Well, and this I I haven't developed this. It just sort of occurred to me. It, it might it might be in a weird way just Tyrion imitating Littlefinger. Um, oh, sort of stepping into his shoes. Yeah, both, as as on, as on both jobs. Yeah, master of coin, master of horse. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, yeah. I I have I mean, that I thought, thought. I thought a the whole ago. bit about you know Podrick is so good at at sex even as a virgin that you know the whores don't take payment was just really over the top and ridiculous in an episode that you know otherwise deals with you know really kind of grim and gritty realism. Um, even hyper-realism. And the only explanation I've heard that kind of halfway redeems that scene is that essentially Tyrion prepaid and is kind of giving Podrick a major ego boost. Um, I, could, I could see that. It doesn't, it doesn't actually forgive the fact that I think this is no. the first time on the show that the nudity has, in fact, been gratuitous. Um, you did not need to hire a contortionate, uh, con yeah. contortionist. Um, that was, you know, he's a virgin. He doesn't, you know, require, and we're, I mean, it's obviously for visual pleasure. I mean, because yeah. there's, you know, sex for pleasure, sex for power, but a contortionist is involved in sex for the visuals of entertainment the things yeah. that can be done to a, uh, and the way a human body can be broken. Um, I just, yeah, it was one of those scenes where I was glad I was not watching with my mother. It would have been, um, yeah, I just or it, anybody it, else's mother for that fact. I mean, it was yeah. sort of an embarrassing scene for the series itself. Yeah, it was. It was one of those scenes that really kind of, um, you know, the jokes about HBO having a quota for boobs or well, the, the old Saturday Night Live skit, right? That it, yeah, the, the SNL skit. It's like that hit a little bit close. I was because I was thinking there's a lot that needs to happen in this episode. There are a lot of plot lines that, you know, could use a bit more development, like, you know, Jon Snow or Stannis, which are still very much in setup mode. Um, I, I, I liked the what they did with Stannis. I thought that was I thought I it liked was it nice. too, but I felt like they could you know, there was definitely room to do to kind of enrich those worlds more. Yeah, those four um, minutes could have been much better spent. Exactly. So, you know, I was just like annoyed that there's like just leave that scene on the cutting room floor. Or if you need it, it can really... I mean, there's nothing that stops that scene from being shifted into next episode. There's uh, something that stops it from being a minute and a half long. They could have literally just yes. deposited Pod at the, the whorehouse and kept going. Yeah, and then right. did the conversation about 
uh, Littlefinger um, borrowing uh, all of this money from the Iron Bank of Bravos, which, by the way, you know, people who are watching the show and not reading the books, uh, remember that name, the Iron Bank of Bravos. Uh, they make Goldman Sachs look like the Peace Corps. Um, you know, and just cut there. And they didn't really need this kind of, you know, embarrassing, um, you know, denouement. The, I, I guess the only other, the only other thing that it might be is they're setting Tyrion up in direct opposition to his father. So as he's trying mm -hmm. to be a father figure to Pod, um, given that the deceptions yeah. that that were around, you know, Tyrion losing his virginity. Um, involving oh. prostitutes and the exchange of money, or the non-exchange of money, or oh, the exchange of money, or that's really weird. So that's really weird because it's it's almost a, an exact reversal of of what Tyrion went through. And so maybe that's, that's freaky. The idea is to turn him Tyrion into an anti tywin which. But I think we're we're reaching here. Oh yeah, no, no I, I definitely we we are we are at this point making excuses. I don't even think we believe. So um, no. On, on, on the note that we're being hypocrites, maybe it's time to wrap this up. Uh, okay. But uh, it's, it's been great. We'll see you all uh, next week after uh, another exciting episode. And it, it should be up by Tuesday. I promise not to lose my voice again for a couple of days. Uh, okay. Not that I did, and not that I'm an asshole who moves <laughs> meetings or podcasts around. Okay. Uh, I'll see you all next week. Bye. All right. And we are.